Okay, fab. Um, so my name's Abby. I'm a, a PEDS reg at the Royal London. I'm also an NHR um, academic clinical lecturer. I'm, I'm going to talk about Stridor um, today. Now, I will prefix this with I'm not an ENT surgeon. Um, so this is a kind of a paediatrics view of Stridor um, based on the fact that we've had quite a few cases recently of slightly more unusual Stridor. So I thought I've had to go and read up on things. So I thought it would be useful to go through um, our learning from these cases. So it oh hang on found the button um so stride on the pediatrician or should i be worried or really worried is the alternative title for this talk um so we're going to go through um some case histories a little bit of anatomy um the differential diagnoses for different presentations of stride or, and then the treatment and management and this will probably last about i think it'll last about 30 minutes the talk but it's got a couple of videos in that i've um got hold of as well. So the first case, now this is a two month old baby um, that was born by emergency C-section for failure to progress, uh, treated with IV antibiotics for maternal GBS, but it had no other concerns. There was reportedly noisy breathing since birth, which mum had had checked out, but everyone had reassured that it was probably nothing to worry about. But then after a couple of weeks of age was noted to have apneas and difficulty in breathing, breathing when uh, breastfeeding. Um, so it was admitted to her local hospital and was started on NG feeds um, and was starting to gain weight and they had referred over for an ENT opinion. Um, so ENT saw um, and they, when they saw her, their child was comfortable at rest. There was this ongoing inspiratory stride or worst on movement, but there even when at rest. Um, there was no intercostal recession or tracheal tug. And within the clinic, they did a, a fiber optic nasal endoscopy and saw an amiga epiglottis and prolapsing retinoids and gave a diagnosis of laryngomalacia. So their plan at that point was a formal NLB, um, which progressed into an ARI epiglottoplasty. I'm going to explain these terms in a minute. A SALT assessment and then will be reviewed post MLB. So this is what they saw on MRB. So this is an Amiga epiglottis. You can see um, that, so this is your Amiga. If you're in a sorority in America, that's what you might have on the front of your house. Um, so, and it, your epiglottis in this case is quite curved in um, and looks more like an Amiga than it does in the normal shape. So a little bit of anatomy. This is uh, head and neck and your epiglottis is just here at the top of your larynx and um, uh, esophagus and what it does is it sits there and it covers your the top of your trachea um, when you're eating so that no food goes into the trachea. It looks like this when we look down when we're intubating um, in neonates and when they intubate older children so you have your epiglottis at the top and then you can see your retinoid folds either side. Now this for some reason all pictures and drawings are the other way up um, but uh, this is what so you've got the areopiglottic folds at either side and then your vocal cords in the middle, which is the bit that you want the tube to go through when you're intubating. Um, and then your esophagus will be closed when you're looking, if you can see the uh, vocal cords open because your epiglottis is covering it. So laryngomalacia. So laryngomalacia is a congenital abnormality of the larynx that allows su dynamic supraglottic collapse um, and results in intermittent upper airway obstruction. And it's that intermittent part that's important um, for the prognostic um, aspect of it. It's pretty much the main laryngeal abnormality. It's the one that most people will see. And it's present from early infancy. There are no, it's not there from birth. And if you've got a, a baby with stride or straight away, you should be considering whether or not there is something else going on and not just laryngomalacia. And the symptoms generally hit their max at about six months. Um, it tends to occur more frequently in boys than girls. And it normally does come on within the first few weeks of life. So normally that kind of once parents have got through the first couple of weeks, they're thinking, oh, hang on, there's not quite the breathing's not quite right. And that's when they normally present. Um, the amount that have additional associated conditions or syndromes is much more increased when it's severe laryngomalacia. And I'll come on to the um, definitions. So the main presentation is that you have this inspiratory stridor. You quite often get feeding difficulties with it and almost always it's associated with the significant reflux and that's an important point for treatment as well. So the clinical features, as I said, inspiratory stridor, 
And actually, you can probably diagnose without further investigation if you have inspiratory stridor that's set in after the first week or so of age. Um, there's normally reflux, so, and that's normally quite obvious reflux that we're only treating. But if you've got stridor that seems significant, um, then you might want to have your diagnosis confirmed on imaging. And your MLB is mainly done to rule out something more significant or more concerning. And what you'll normally see is what they, we've mentioned before, so short aryepiglottic folds and coming out from the um, sides and a curled omega-shaped epiglottis. And the reason for that is because the epiglottis is being pulled on by the, um, by the floppiness of the rest of the larynx. So you can classify it into different um, uh, severity. So mild disease is normally, you have this audible stridor, if you look down you can probably see laryngo malacia, but there's no respiratory distress and there's no evidence of failure to thrive, so they're gaining weight, they're not struggling with their feeding. Moderate disease, you might have a little bit of increased work of breathing, a bit of sternal recession, you might get some progressive feeding difficulties and weight loss um, or inadequate gain in weight. And then severe disease will present with significant shortness of breath and airway obstruction, failure to thrive and dysphagia, and then possibly apneas and hypoxia or hypercapnia. And then more kind of further down the uh, line, you might have um, severe chest deformities if it's not been diagnosed or treated early enough. What you'll also see is that a lot of these babies may present, particularly in the winter period, with bron significant bronchiolitis because they've already got a floppy larynx, so it exacerbates that. So this is a video from um, uh, YouTube, uh, which shows you MLBs of various airways, which I'm going to play. Do let me know if it doesn't work properly. you can hear the strider as that's happening and you can see how floppy the airway is and it's coming down at the sides and it's that that's giving you your strider and you can you can hear that the baby's upset sorry this is an FNE not an L MLB and um, and that's why it's better to see these things on a dynamic study because you'll be able to see the evidence a lot better oh, hang on. Um, say so the treatment, uh, mild laryngomalacia, uh, reassurance and observation, um, and probably needs some reflux treatment. Um, if you look at uh, the best practice guidelines, they suggest omeprazole as your kind of first line treatment for these babies. Um, if you're moderate, this is the point where your ENT team need to decide whether or not they need surgical therapy. And I think this is based more on presentations to hospital, how much it's affecting their breathing and how whether or not they are having significant infections alongside it. Um, they'll probably also need an SLT, a salt review um, to look at feeding and to make sure that they're safe to feed. And severe will almost always need surgery. Um, they may need BiPAP in between just to maintain the airway, particularly um, if you're waiting for surgery, or they might need it afterwards if they still have significant apneas afterwards. So the surgical treatment, again, I'm not an ENT surgeon, but this is the surgical treatment. So this is a supraglottoplasty. The, the child in our case had an areopiglottoplasty. So this one, they've pretty much removed the folds here completely, and that then releases um, the epiglottis so that it's not so pulled in. And areopiglottoplasty just cuts through um, and releases the folds. 
um, both are designed to try and open up the airway and stop it being so floppy. These ones pretty much remove any extra tissue that there is there. And your differentials when you're thinking about laringa malacia are things that are more serious um, or that might have a different kind of treatment so your vocal cord palsies now this would present with a slightly different story you'd probably get a more of a history of an abnormal cry there's quite often a history of birth trauma possibly known Arnold Chiari malformations baby a baby that's been on the neonatal unit or a baby that's had um, cardiac surgery and so they've had an iatrogenic injury subglottic stenosis so this picture just here you can see that below the vocal cords there is a narrowing um, that one actually isn't that narrow. There are some that can get extremely narrow down to a couple of millimetres. And these babies are normally ones that have been, again, on the neonatal unit with frequent um, intubations and recurrent intubations that's caused trauma. They'll need, um, so they'll need ballooning or um, sometimes even stenting. A laryngeal web. So you can see that you've got the whole and then you've got a complete lack of the normal anatomy here um, because you've got a web connecting everything. Laryngeal cleft up here, you might see more of those and quite often we get um, referred laryngeal clefts from the speech and language team. So they've had, they've got significant reflux, they've had a video fluoroscopy and on the video fluoroscopy they can see um, that there is on the end of um, swallowing that there is uh, food or liquid going into the trachea. Um, so that may need, fi that may need surgical fixing. You can get subglottic hemangiomas, which I haven't got a picture of, but basically subglottic hemangiomas are um, a collection of blood vessels that are below the glottis. They're most often associated with children that have got external hemangiomas as well. So it's important to think about that. If you've got anyone that's got a big strawberry nevus or anything um, as a baby and they've got stridor, then do they have a hemangioma? The treatments for subglottic hemangioma um, is propranolol to try and shrink it down. Um, but uh, there are very few kind of guidelines for this and there's a team over at Great Ormond Street that do um, deal with the hemangiomas. And then you can get laryngeal cysts, so big giant cysts in the larynx that will obviously make things more difficult both for um, if you need to do any surgery and intubate, but also um, there's the potential that they could pop on um, contact. So in summary, laryngomalacia um, it is extremely common. The majority will resolve without intervention. It's really important to uh, treat the reflux because actually it can make everything much more difficult to treat otherwise. And if it's significant and it's affecting feeding or apneas, then a referral to ENT for an FNE or an MLB and possible surgery. So just back to our case, um, so this little one had surgery, which relieved the strider and the laryngomalacia. Because of the significant reflux initially, they've needed to have ongoing NG feeding, but they have a normal swallow on video fluoroscopy now, and they're starting to gain weight and thriving, and will be followed up by the ENT team. Now this case also highlighted another issue which is who follows up these children so obviously the ENT surgeons will follow them up from an airway perspective but who then follows them up from an NG feeding perspective and they will need a general paediatrician um, and community nursing teams to support them they don't necessarily need re uh, tertiary respiratory paediatrics once the airway has been effectively fixed um, so we, our role as paediatricians is probably to support the uh, SALT team in the feeding support. They may need this NG tube for quite a long period of time. And, but more importantly, we'll be the seeing these children in A&E when they present. So we need to um, be aware of what their normal presentation is. How it, Do they have ongoing stridor or not? The parents are really useful to tell you whether this is normal for them or not. But also don't be um, thrown by that. So if mum says that this baby has been breathing like this for a long time and it's just normal, it might be normal for them, but that doesn't mean it doesn't need investigating. Um, so even if they do have kind of normal saturations and the rest of the examination is normal, I'd still suggest a baby coming with recurrent episodes of stride or initially it's not normal for a Laringa malacia to need to be seen that often. So they need to go over to ENT and make friends with your ENT surgeons. They're actually really um, keen for people to go and watch um, and have a look. And actually it's much easier for you to explain Laringa malacia to a parent if you've actually seen it in real life. So the next case is a little bit more, um, a little bit older. So we have an 18 month old boy. He'd had three episodes of creep 
um, with significant respiratory distress on each presentation, preceded by a viral infection. And they'd responded to steroids briefly, but he'd come back quite frequently over about a month period. This was his third admission. And on this admission, as well as his biphasic stridor, he also had melina and calfi ground vomiting. And his SATs were 95% in air, but he had no cough this time and no chorizal symptoms. So croup. This is classical. So you can see that as well, he could, you can hear the audible inspiratory strider, he's got a barking cough, he's got increased work of breathing and subcostal and so intercostal recessions as this uh, person taking the video very nicely shows. So croup is effectively laryngotracheal bronchitis, so it's, a, it's an inflammation of the upper airway. It's a very, again, a common childhood illness. Around 3% of all children will have at least one episode of croup. And it normally affects children from six months to three years of age. Um, and it's normally caused by a viral infection causing this inflammation. And most of the time it's parainfluenza type one or three. Risk factors for bad croup are if you're a boy and if you've had previous intubations because you've already got a damaged airway. So how do you um, how do you decide how severe it is? So um, this is based on the this is these are Australian guidelines, but they it, they all kind of fit into similar things. So mild croup would be um, a child that's quite happy, smiling. They don't really have any stride or apart from when they're crying. And um, they've got a normal respiratory rate and normal accessory muscle use, but they've got this barking cough. Moderate is when they're starting to get a bit more upset. They're intermittently stride or at, even at rest. Um, they've got an increased respiratory rate and they've got moderate chest roll retraction. Um, and then severe, you've got this increasing agitation, drowsiness, when you're starting to get really worried. They've got persistent stride or even at rest, a marked increase or decrease in their respiratory rates, significant work of breathing. And this is important. Hypoxia is a late sign. It indicates life-threatening creep. Um, and if we've got to the point where the SATs are low, that's when you want to have as many people there as possible. So how do we treat it? Um, there, are, there used to be a score for this, and it's down the bottom, so there's a croup score that gives you um, uh, points, but actually all of these croup scores would result in you giving treatment, so it depends on what the child looks like. If you've got a child that looks quite well, um, but they have a barking cough, um, parents are sensible and you're, uh, you're happy that they would be able to take them home um, and monitor them at home, then you could... Um, you could give them a dose of dexamethasone and send them home. Um, we used to give two doses, so we used to give a follow-up dose at about 12 hours for the parents to give, um, but actually if they need that dose it's better for them to come back and be re-reviewed because if it's got worse again then we need to review them. Moderate creep, give them the full dose of dexamethasone, so this one isn't, uh, unless they've updated it, this isn't in the uh, BNF, the BNF dose is 0.15, so have this guideline to hand if you're going to prescribe it, and so give them 600 mics per kilo of dexamethasone, and um, possible ne nebulized budesonide, and if they do look not great, then actually giving them some paracetamol and ibuprofen if they haven't had that recently will help, because the majority of them are caused by viral infections, so actually that will also help and it'll help a little with the inflammation as well. And then your severe croup, which are on your score is, um, these are the children with severe recessions and that look really quite unwell. Hopefully your saturations haven't dropped, but I, this is the point where I would be calling for your registrar if, you've got, um, if you're on your own and considering your only persistent ENT and staying with a child and not that's important. So not leaving the child alone, um, getting someone else to make the phone calls for you, giving some nebulized adrenaline. Um, remember, they might get upset while this happens. So be sure that you you know that you're happy that there's someone else there if you need to support the airway. And these are the ones that you might want to get cats to come and see as well. It might be that giving some adrenaline and some um, steroids actually makes everything settle down and then you can move them back over to the moderate group, group and continue. But your differential diagnoses are the things that you need to be thinking about when you see any child with croup. And I've divided them into the scary ones and the other scary ones. So bacterial tracheitis, um, this will present with fever, sudden onset of stridor and significant respiratory distress. 
epiglottitis, slightly different, and I'll come back with a, a bit more detail, but basically onset of high fever, dysphagia, drooling, anxiety, non-barking cough, and they will be sat there with their head and neck extended. Now this used to be called uh, mainly by hip, so we've seen a reduction over the years. You can get foreign bodies in the upper airway. Again, this will come with a kind of a sudden onset stride or there's normally a clear history. There's normally a toddler that's been left um, and they've gone back in the room and something that was on the floor isn't there anymore. Um, and then there won't be any kind of prodrome symptoms with these children. They might have a retropharyngeal abscess. Um, so again, this is another one, so dysphagia and drooling. They might, their strider won't be so obvious as with epiglottitis, um, but they will have neck stiffness and they'll probably have um, cervical lymphadenopathy. And again, this though will normally be much more gradual. So your, um, your epiglottitis is quite sudden, whereas an abscess would normally have a much slower onset and they might have already had some treatment for tonsillitis before this. You can also get angioneurotic edema, which is acute swelling of the upper airway, and it's normally associated with swelling of everything else as well and can occur at any age. Um, there might be a family history here as well. And uh, obviously allergic reactions can, um, um, can at times cause um, stridor as well. So anything that you might think, and if they're known to have allergies, then that's something to think about. Epiglottitis in particular, so this is cellulitis effectively of the supraglottis, so the airway just above the glottis, um, that might cause airway compromise. It's an emergency and it's fortunately much rarer now than it used to be. And it, not, it used to affect mainly children that were two to six. But since Hib vaccination has come in, it's reduced quite dramatically. But there has been an increase in adolescents and adults getting epiglottitis, and that's from meningococcal W, um, which is why they have brought in that vaccination in the adolescent period now, or well, they're thinking of bringing it in. Again, rapid onset of high fever, sore throat, they'll be sat there drooling and they have this classic tripod positioning that looks like this. So they've got their hands either side of them, head up. This is a nice old style um, academic picture and you can see that they've put some cyanosis there as well. But they will, they'll be sat there, they'll look uncomfortable. So what do we do? Um, the, although it's quite difficult, the main thing is to remain calm and remain calm for the parents around the child as well but to act fast you'll need ENT anaesthetics and senior support and you want to avoid doing anything that can upset the child the diagnosis is effectively clinical if they are drooling and sitting like that and they've got a fever then you it's epiglottitis until proven otherwise and you're going to need to secure that airway not you personally but the most appropriate person to do that will do and you need to start antibiotics promptly if they've escalated while you've been there and they've already got a cannula in, you can give antibiotics. If they've not got a cannula in, don't put it in now. So this is the CATS guideline for epiglottitis. You've called for senior help. Let the child do whatever they want, whichever position they want to sit in. They need to be monitored and you need to have someone in the room with them at all time. And if you can give humidified oxygen if they're tolerating it. Don't upset the child. So Try not to remove the parents, don't put cannulas in, don't send them for x-rays. Neck x-rays used to be done, um, but there's no need for them now. Um, and don't leave the child unsupervised. And certainly don't look at the back of the throat. Um, this is just generalised indications for intubation. So we won't be, as paediatricians, intubating these children, um, but we need to be aware of why we would want to intubate, because we're going to be the ones calling for the anaesthetist to come down and help us. So if they've got suspected, suspected epiglottitis, that is a reason to intubate. Other things would include inhalation injuries, or but when you've got epiglottitis, if they've got a fall in conscious level, it looks like they're becoming exhausted or they're hypoxic, we need to get a tube in as soon as possible and secure the airway. What you do need is your ENT support because they may need a surgical airway. This is important if you're in a hospital that doesn't have on-site ENT. Um, they normally will have on-call that can come in and they might need to come in from home. So you need to support the child in the meantime while you're waiting for everyone to arrive. The most experienced anaesthetist should be called in um, and most uh, anaesthetic teams will call them in um, routinely as soon as they hear that there is a sick child. Most anaesthetists would favour a gas induction. That is because otherwise it's, it's much easier to relax the airway that way. Um, so this child is probably going to need to move to theatres, um, which would be you're going to need to help with that. They're going to anticipate a difficult airway. Um, and if you've not done an ICU job or 
an anaesthetic job. There are checklists that we use these days that we, we have out, and that means that we've also got a backup, a backup plan and a backup plan times two in case things go wrong. And the the backup for this would be a surgical airway, which is why ENT are needed. Um, and you need to anticipate that smaller ETs are going to be needed um, by age because um, it's never going to be a normal airway at this point. So you want to obtain croup tubes if you've got them, which is slightly different, but otherwise just a smaller ET tube. And this is why you are worried about intubating a child like this. So on the left hand side, we have a nice normal airway. You can see the cord, you can see the hole that you want to be able to put the tube through. And this is quite likely to be what you'll see if you go down and try and intubate a child with epiglottitis. So your epiglottis is massively swollen, it's red, it's falling forwards, you can't see the airway. You would use a video laryngoscope most likely to have a look. And if you see this, you would be considering whether you need um, a bougie, so something to put down first, put your tube over the top. Um, and so it's, it's a worrying situation for even skilled people to intubate with this degree of edema. Fortunately, we don't see it very often. So post intubation, again, this is you're likely to be here. So you probably would have had someone called cats while you're while someone's intubating these children. Um, and so once the airway obstruction is bypassed, they're normally really easy to ventilate because the issue is the upper airway and not uh, the lungs, unless you've got bacterial tracheitis because they might have further down involvement. Make sure that hopefully someone tapes the tube securely because you don't want it to come back out and you don't want to swap that tube. And if you haven't already given steroids, you may wish to give some more um, and you will want to give your antibiotics. And then they'll need to be transferred out to an intensive care unit. So acute upper airway obstruction, kind of a summary. The most likely diagnosis is going to be creep. Um, and the most worrying features that you're going to have are the, if they are sat in an unusual position that looks like they're trying to open their airway and they are drooling, that's when I would worry and that's when I would ask for help. Um, you might want your ENT team there quite early and you're certainly going to want anaesthetics and just don't do anything that's going to cause further distress. Your best friend here is going to be your play specialist to try and calm the child down. But actually, back to our case. So this was a child with th um, three recurrent episodes of creep. They were all quite easily treated, um, but there was new onset melina and coffee ground vomits. We thought this was probably most likely due to repeated doses of steroids in the um, in the month beforehand, and also that he'd been on pretty regular uh, ibuprofen for pain and fever from the recurrent infections and pain. Um, so we admitted him, started him on IV ranitidine, and asked for ENT. Now ENT had already been asked to do an MLB or in a review previously, but they expedited their MLB. And on MLB, they saw this. So you can see within the airway, um, your epiglottis is pulled back. You've got your, just about can see your vocal cords, um, but you've got all these little um, cystic swellings on the airway and on this one as well. And so this child is a child that had recurrent papillomatosis. So recurrent respiratory papillomatosis, it's really rare. Um, the, what we could find was around one to four cases of 100,000 births, and it usually presents between infancy and four years. And it quite often has a child with a hoarse voice, um, followed by persistent stride, or particularly if they then get an, a subsequent viral infection on top. Other red flags um, would include abnormal cry and dysphonia or aphonia, and risk factors would include uh, maternal age less than 20, a vaginal delivery and firstborn child. And the majority of cases are caused by HPV 6 and 11, which are the ones that are normally identified in genital warts. Um, there was no history of that in this case, um, so it's not entirely clear where this um, infection came from. Uh, treatment is debridement, so they would go in um, and remove the papillomatosis. Um, and there is a possible role for antiviral treatment as the child gets older. So these are images of much more severe cases that I found on Google. Um, so you can see that these ones have got to the point where they're completely taking over the airway. Um, so you'd need to go in and debride out the papillomas. So this child had a, a surgical debridement and had a rapid improvement in symptoms, but they now need regular debridements um, that will get more frequent as time goes on. But otherwise they are gaining weight and otherwise quite well. So in stridor, stride, in summary, stridor in childhood is a sign of upper airway um, obstruction. There, you should have a low threshold for referral to ENT, um, particularly if it's significant or there's repeated episodes. 
If they weren't coming into hospital for any reason, then ENT should review. If it's an acute upper airway obstruction, call for help early. You want the person there that can secure the airway. And always think about your differential diagnoses um, and think through the, when the child is presented and whether or not this has been present since birth or whether it's an acute thing. Um, so that is everything from me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Abby. That was really useful. Um, a small sort of simple question for me. Um, I saw a kid who was just clerking in the sleep unit who had um, Laringa Malacia and I think he was still having symptoms of that and he was sort of school age. At what age with Laringa Malacia, you know, would you be telling parents you'd expect it should be resolved? They should really, they should have really, if it's simple laryngomalacia, they it should resolve by the time you're getting to primary school. So, kind of three, four, it should have settled by now. And if it hasn't, then it might need intervention. Yeah, is what okay, I Okay, great. Think. Yes. Um, we have a question popping up here um, from Sophia. What is the first line investigation for suspected vascular ring? Um, so there's two trains of thought for vascular rings. Um, so you've either got your imaging, so you'll need cardiac CT imaging. So you'll want uh, cardiac CT with uh, a contrast to have a look that way. And then the other way is to have a look yourself. So you do a bronchoscopy. Um, but probably the simplest thing to do is an echo followed by a CT. Um, if you're worried that there's stridor from some other um, compressive reason, then you would go down and do a bronchoscopy. Question from Megan here. After how many episodes of croup would you refer to ENT? Um, it's difficult because it's it, it, it can be quite frequent. And once you've had your first um, episode of croup, um, you're more likely to have it again. I think it depends more about the frequency of it. So if you're having croup from viral infections, maybe one episode, you know, it might happen with every episode of um viral infection but if you've had more than kind of two or three episodes of croup in a short period so within a year I'd get ENT to see just to make sure there isn't anything else going on. Lots of great questions um, just so that everyone's aware I've posted the link so you can give feedback on the teaching 